Good morning, and uh, welcome to the meeting of the Subcommittee on Zoning and Franchises. I'm Councilmember Francisco Moya, the Chairperson of the Subcommittee, uh, and today we are joined by Council Members Konstantinidis, uh, Gradenchek, Richards, Torres, uh, Rivera. Uh, we are also joined by uh, the Chair of Land Use, uh, Chairman Salamanca, uh, and Councilwoman uh, Debbie Rose. Uh, today we will be voting on a number of applications previously heard by the Subcommittee, and we will hold uh, one public hearing. Uh, please also note that LU 419 for the Court Square Block 3 text amendment is being laid over. Uh, today we will vote to approve with modifications pre-considered LU numbers uh, 436, 437 for the 2 Howard Avenue rezoning in Brooklyn. The proposal would amend the zoning map to zone the project area from an R6B, a C24 district, to a C4 4L district and would include a related zoning text amendment to map the site as a mandatory inclusionary housing area utilizing options one and two. As proposed, these actions would facilitate the development of a new six-story mixed-use building, including retail use on the ground floor and approximately 30 residential units, of which approximately eight would be affordable under the MIH program. Uh, our modification uh, will be to remove MIH option two, requiring the use of MIH option one. Uh, council member Amprey Samuels is in support of this application as modified by the council. Uh, today we will also be voting to approve pre-considered LUs uh, number uh, 420 through 423 with modifications for four separate land use actions requested by the Department of City Planning and the Department uh, for Housing, Preservation and Development in connection with the special Bay Street Corridor di uh, District rezoning in Staten Island. The special Bay Street Corridor rezoning proposal would rezone approximately 20 blocks in the area of downtown Staten Island near the St. George, Stapleton, and Tompkinsville neighborhoods to require contextual buildings and new affordable housing and to promote economic development within a vibrant, mixed-use downtown environment. Additionally, the proposal would facilitate new development with affordable housing, community facility, and economic development components on city-owned land. The Council is modifying the zoning text application in response to concerns voiced by community members regarding the urban design uh, of, anticipated, uh, of anticipated new development and affordability levels for residential development. The Council is modifying the zoning text amendment LU uh, 421 to remove both mandatory inclusionary housing option two and the workforce option. The final version will map MIH option one and the deep affordability option, which together require the deepest affordability possible. Uh, the council is also modifying the bulk rules to require building heights in certain areas to more closely reflect the local neighborhood character. Uh, the council is modifying the bulk regulations within subdistricts uh, A and D, including the creation of two uh, sub areas within subdistrict D establishing uh, locally appropriate density, height, and setback rules. The Council's text modifications would also include uh, clarifications regarding uh, use regulations for existing public transportation facilities and bulk regulations to accommodate DOE school use uses in special Stapleton Waterfront District. Within uh, regard to LU, with regard to LU 423, the proposed uh, UDAP uh, disposition that is a part of the rezoning proposal, the Council notes that HPD has submitted a revised uh, project summary for the future development of the disposition site at 539 Jersey Street. The revised submission clarifies that the site will be developed with a residential component of approximately 223 units that will be 100 percent affordable and include a portion to be set aside for affordable senior housing. The community is represented by Council Member Debbie Rose, who has dedicated countless hours uh, with the de Blasio administration and stakeholders for many years uh, to ensure that this process results in the best possible outcome for her community. Uh, and I would like to uh, invite uh, Council Member Rose to make some remarks uh, prior to her vote. Thank you so much, Chair Moya. I want to thank you for your support um, for this uh, rezoning. Um, you've been so helpful and supportive. I am very excited to announce my support for this rezoning of the Bay Street Corridor in my district. The road was long, but with the guidance and the input from my constituents and the many stakeholders, I have secured the necessary funding and commitments 
for the next chapter of the story of the North Shore. For too long, planning on Staten Island has been haphazard or non-existent. Today we have before us a blueprint for a well-planned future. Through many negotiations over nearly four years, I am pleased to be delivering several critical community investments that respond to the needs of the existing community, while also providing a sustainable path for the future of the North Shore. First and foremost, I have secured a commitment to fully affordable housing on publicly owned property as a part of this project. The North Shore is not a gated community, and I have maintained a commitment to ensure that no one feels shut out of their own neighborhood. The two phases of the Homeport site on the new Stapleton waterfront will include approximately 600 affordable housing units with 30% of the units in the first phase of development for residents making up to 50% AMI, guaranteeing that a broad spectrum of residents will be able to access new affordable housing in a desirable waterfront location. We have also secured commitments to build 100% affordable housing at 539 Jersey Street, which will have a minimum of 25% of the affordable housing on the site to serve households making less than 50% of AMI and 90 units of senior housing. Not only have we secured 100% affordable housing on the waterfront, but the School of Construction Authority will build a brand new, approximately 600 seat elementary or elementary intermediate school on the site as well. I have fought hard to make sure that the much needed school seats in our district are actually built. Along with the new waterfront school, SCA has committed to another new elementary school at the old Hungerford School site and to build a new annex for PS13 to provide additional seats. That's two brand new schools in addition to the one we are currently building on Targi Street. To ensure that residents have access to adequate open space, we have secured the building of 12 acres of contiguous or continuous waterfront esplanade that will include open space amenities such as playgrounds, basketball court, dog runs, picnic area, pickleball, that seems to be, I don't know what it is. So, don't, don't hurt me, people, because I, I don't know what pickleball is. And comfort stations. <laughs> a key connection, the proposed Tompkinsville Esplanade between this new waterfront development and the ferry terminal has been long discussed, but it is now finally funded with, and can we, uh, with, um, uh, I think it's $74 million to complete it. This will give residents in the corridor and beyond new options for commuting and recreation. No longer will pedestrians and bicyclists need to compete for space on limited roadways, on limited roadways. The Tompkinsville Esplanade will provide a safe pedestrian oriented space that will close the existing gaps in the North Shore waterfront and will include resiliency measures for a safe and sustainable future, a key piece in my long-term vision for a continuous North Shore Esplanade that makes the waterfront publicly accessible and not just for those who can pay for it. The administration has committed to 100 vouchers for North Shore families to move out of shelters into affordable housing in the North Shore. Several agencies have also committed to dedicated legal services for residents of the North Shore who may face displacement as development occurs. We have also secured $15 million in necessary sewer infrastructure work along Bay Street to ensure new development does not create flooding or drainage issues. This funding is separate from the 45 million in new sewers. The realignment of Front Street and the utilities at the Stapleton waterfront. Growth in the North Shore should open up economic opportunities for our residents, which is why we have secured funding to reactivate 55 Stuyvesant Place for a mix of job generating uses and guaranteed prevailing wages 
for all building service workers in new buildings or buildings that receive one million or more in public financial assistance. And finally, 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 the long delayed rebuilding of the Cromwell Recreation Center at the Lions Pool. For those of you who are listening have no idea what that means, but to the people in my district, that was huge and that was, I was told, better be the deal breaker. So um, that will be located at Lions Pools, which was damaged beyond repair in 2010, is fully funded. The $92 million in new funds will ensure that the Cromwell Center will be built on the Lions Pool site with an anticipating opening of the community center in 2025. We will not and did not allow them to put this in the budget in the out years. This will be in the 2020 budget. This neighborhood anchor will provide a variety of re recreational activities identified in the previous community engagement process, and we have guaranteed that the city will work with the community on the design and programming at the new center as plans are finalized. We have a series of other commitments that I don't have time to list here, because Chair Moya is rolling his eyes at me. <laughs> but I believe my constituents will be pleased with the $250 million package we, des we delivered for the North Shore. All of these commitments include many strategies to ensure that the North Shore is better equipped to deal with the new housing and population growth accompanying this development. I fought, for, I fought for the city to make good on their prior commitments. I fought for the best for the North Shore and fought to respond to the stakeholders who voiced their concerns. With local stakeholder support, I believe we have reached a plan that will meet the needs of our neighborhoods but more importantly, will be a roadmap to a new investment in Staten Island and create vital opportunities for the future of our borough. And finally, I wanna thank the City Council Land Use Team, who are just absolutely phenomenal. Raju Mann, Amy Levitan, John Douglas, Arthur Han, Kevin Cote, and Kelly Rosa, who um, we became like roommates through this process. I wanna thank you. Without their expertise and dedication to this project, we would not be here this morning. I want to also say thank you to my staff, my chief of staff, Christine Johnson, and um, to Vince Grignani and Issa Rogers for their dedication to this project as well. I urge my colleagues to vote yes on this application. And I want to thank you, Chair Moya, and always the um, speaker of the city council for your support during this process. Thank you. Thank you, Debbie. Congratulations. And for the record, I was, I was rolling my eyes at Salamanca, not you. <laughs> uh, I just want to make a quick note here uh, regarding LU's uh, 436 and 437. Uh, the council is also modifying the proposal to include the MIH deep affordability option uh, in addition uh, to option one. Uh, I now call for a vote to approve with uh, modification, uh, the modifications I described, pre-considered LUs 420 uh, through 423, and pre-considered LUs 420, uh, 436 and 437. Uh, council, uh, please call the roll. Chair Moya. Aye. Council Member Constantinidis. Aye. Council Member Richards. Congratulations to Council Member Debbie Rose on a job well done and to the chairs, I vote aye. Council Member Rivera. Aye. Council Member Torres. Aye. Council Member Gurdenchik. I vote aye on all. I congratulate Ms. Rose and pickleball is for people that are <laughs> a little pickled, let's put it that way. It's for the older crowd, but it's, it's sweeping the nation and you're gonna like it. Thank you. I know. I have a vote of six in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. The items are approved and referred to the full land use committee. Thank you. Uh, and again, congratulations, Debbie. This is uh, a great day for you and the uh, people of Staten Island. Thank you so much. 
Uh, I now will be moving to our public hearing. Uh, today we are holding a hearing on uh, LU numbers uh, 424 uh, through 427 for the Brook uh, 156 rezoning in Council Member Salamanca's district in the Bronx. Uh, the applicant uh, seeks approval for a zoning map amendment to rezone the existing R72 district to a C62 district a related zoning text amendment to map the site within a mandatory inclusionary housing area with MIH option one and option two, approval for the disposition of city-owned property and a special permit to allow development on or over the uh, rail yard, uh, right, uh, over the rail yard right of way. As proposed, these actions would facilitate uh, the development of a new nine-story mixed-use building uh, with approximately 54 affordable housing units, approximately 1,100 square feet of community facility use, and approximately 1,300 square feet of open space. Uh, I now open the public hearing on this application, uh, and I would like to turn it over to uh, Chair Salamanca uh, for uh, his remarks. Thank you, uh, Chair Moya. Good morning. Um, welcome. Um, first, I, uh, I want to thank the Langu staff and HPD for, uh, for working with us. Uh, just to give you a little history as to what's happening in, in the South Bronx, I've been in office for a little over three years, and in the three years that I've been in office, I've approved over 4,900 units of 100% affordable housing, all mixed income housing, ensuring that we have housing for the homeless families, and you know, I have this, uh, I'm pushing this 15% homeless set aside. I see that as part of this project, you're very, you are, um, you are uh, recommending a 17% homeless set aside. Um, <clears throat> and I also believe in mixed income, uh, ensuring that extremely low families have access to housing and also our working class families have access to housing. Um, I, the concerns that I have with this project is that I feel that you're in this in your income bracket you're going a little too high um, in terms of your 90 percent AMI. Uh, I find it irresponsible of me to approve a project where your 90 percent AMI units are higher than my 30 percent AMI units and I've made this clear to HPD and I've made this clear to the developer and I made this clear to the land use team. Um, I look forward to your testimony. I look forward to having an, uh, a dialogue. Um, but, you know, me se uh, putting, 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 um, setting a line on the, on, on, the, on the sand, I cannot support a project where 90% AMI units are, are higher than the 30% AMI units. And I cannot support a project where there's MIH option one and option two. The only MIH option that I will be supportive of is MIH option one. So I hope that we can come to an agreement. This is city owned land. This is not privately owned land. And I believe that when we're talking about city owned land, we should make it affordable for those residents that live in that immediate community. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just before we, we begin, I just want to uh, recognize that we've been joined by uh, Council Member Lansman, and I just want to quickly open up the rolls for uh, the vote. A continuing vote of the land use items, Council Member Lansman. By vote of seven in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions, and the items are approved and referred to the full land use committee. Thank you. Uh, Ted Weinstein. Michael uh, Wadman. Genevieve Michael. Uh, Council, if you could uh, swear in the panel. Please uh, state your name as part of the uh, response. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, and that you will answer all questions truthfully? Genevieve Michael, yes. Ted Weinstein, yes. Thank you. You may begin. Land use numbers uh, 424 to 427 are related to ULERP actions pertaining to disposition approval of a city-owned lot, a zoning map change, a special permit, and a zoning text amendment in order to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area for a project known as Brook 156, located at 740 Brook Avenue, 
Block uh, 2360, Lot 3, in the Melrose section of the Bronx in Council District 7, 17. Uh, Brook 156 will be developed by the sponsor, Phipps Houses, who proposes to construct a residential building under HPD's Extremely Low and Low Income, or ELLA, program. Under the ELLA program, sponsors develop buildings in order to create low income rental housing for families with a range of incomes from 30% to 60% of the area median income, and projects may include a tier of units with rents targeted to households earning up to 100% of AMI. Subject to project underwriting, up to 30% of the units may be rented to formerly homeless households referred by the Department of uh, Homeless Housing or other public agencies. The project consists of the city-owned lot, lot three, and adjacent uh, privately owned lot, lot one. Lot one is a formal rail right-of-way uh, inactive open-cut railroad trench. Both lots were designated as part of urban renewal site 404 uh, under the Mott Haven North uh, Urban Renewal Plan, the Mott Haven Plan in 1994. It should be noted that while the Mott Haven Urban Renewal Plan will not expire until the year 2034, the land use restrictions of site 404 did expire in 2008. Land use number 424 is related to an amendment of the zoning map. The change seeks to change the R72 to C62 in order to facilitate the construction of more affordable units than would be allowed under existing zoning in a building that is consistent with the density of the surrounding area. Land use number 425 will facilitate the construction of a nine a uh, story building with approximately 51 affordable dwelling units, plus one unit for a superintendent. Uh, the unit mixture is comprised of 11 studios, 19 one bedrooms, 14 two bedrooms, and eight three bedrooms. Uh, targeted incomes will be between up to 30% up to 80% of the area median income, with up to 20% of the units targeted to 110% of AMI. Rents will be affordable to families from 27% to 80% of AMI, with up to 20% of the units affordable to families with incomes up to 90% AMI, although obviously understand those conversations are ongoing. Uh, amenities include approximately 1,119 square feet of community facility space, a fitness center, and laundry room. Uh, land use number 426 seeks approval of an amendment of the zoning resolution in order to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area mapping option. Option one requires 20% of the units be affordable to 60% of AMI, with 10% required to be 40% of AMI. Uh, proposed affordability for the project far exceeds the option one minimum. Additionally, HPD will be requiring an at, le at least an additional 15% of the units be permanently affordable for at least 40% of the units. Uh, land use number 427 seeks approval of a special permit that will allow for a development over a formal rail right of way. Uh, so in order to facilitate the development of the Brook 156 project, HPD is before the council seeking approval of land use numbers 424 to 427. Thanks. Hi, I'm Michael Wadman, uh, Vice President of Real Estate Development at Phipps Houses. Thank you, Council Members, for uh, letting us present to you today. Uh, given the description of the project that you just received, um, I'll try to focus on items that are uh, not duplicative. Uh, you see the project location here um, at the corner of East 156th Street and Brook Avenue. Uh, it's just north of another Phipps Houses development called Via Verde. Uh, quite near uh, the La Central development and a lot of the other housing going up in, uh, and that has gone up in Melrose. This is a key area for Phipps. We own about 2,000 apartments in this uh, general part of the Bronx. Uh, we also provide a lot of social services uh, in this area. And this is a site that we've owned since 2011. So uh, we're pretty excited to be here talking to you about it and uh, looking forward to resolution of any open issues and proceeding. Uh, Phipps is the largest not-for-profit housing uh, developer, owner, and manager uh, in New York City. We've been around since 1905, uh, and we're committed to keeping all of our housing uh, affordable, essentially in perpetuity. We've only uh, uh, lost one project to unaffordable forces when we were sued by our limited partners many years ago. So you can count on us to, uh, to preserve this um, important community asset. The zoning actions were already listed, so I'll... Um, pass over those if you don't mind, um, and give you a little more feel uh, for the building. Uh, on the community facility space, I'm not sure if I heard that the number was right in the earlier presentation. It's 1,100 square feet. Uh, okay. All right. My apologies. Good. I just wanted to make sure I was uh, hearing that correctly. Uh, that's space that we expect our social service agency, Phipps Neighborhoods, to occupy. 
uh, and they're focusing on identifying a form of workforce development or employment training for young adults that would be uh, housed in that location. That's one of their key issue areas. Um, as mentioned previously, we have a lot owned by a FIPS affiliate uh, and, a, and a lot owned by HPD. Uh, it's also along this railroad right away that uh, was described. Um, one thing that's, I think, most exciting about this is that this particular site has been a real blight for, uh, since around the time I was born in the late 60s, uh, from what I've gathered from the records. Uh, it attracts trespassers and garbage and illegal activity, uh, and I think uh, removing, it's also surrounded by now redeveloped uh, housing with, uh, with good neighbors who don't like the site being uh, in the state it is. So it's gonna be exciting to clear that and, and put some nice housing there. Um, the bridge closure was also mentioned. This is what the site looks like again, pretty, uh, pretty derelict. And uh, DOT is now working on that so that uh, we should be able to proceed once they're done um, closing that tunnel. Uh, it's the shape of the building. Um, and then a couple more, uh, the renderings that you saw on the cover page. Uh, we think it's an um, attractive building that fits in with the other buildings around it. Um, as a very active ground floor with the community facility place we described as well as a, a lobby and the community room is, is focused on the ground floor with windows to the street. Uh, so there'll be quite a lot of uh, eyes on the street. These are the other uh, sides of the building. The ground floor, uh, as I mentioned, has the community center as well as the community facility space and a fitness center for tenants. Um, even though it's a small building, by providing uh, good solid amenity areas and actually an outdoor uh, patio deck in, in the rear. We think we're uh, providing a very high level of amenity uh, for the people who will live here. That's the typical floor apartment distributions uh, lobby. So we're really looking uh, to make this not a, a low income looking building, uh, regardless of the deep affordability that we'll be providing. Um, as discussed, um, the conversations are ongoing on the specific median uh, income bands. We are, um, FIPS is really willing to implement whatever uh, is, is agreed upon. Serving uh, formerly homeless as well as 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, 90 percent of median. We think, uh, you know, we support mixed income housing uh, completely. And I think by uh, providing this kind of level of mixed income community, it adds a lot to the building as well as to the neighborhood. Um, as I mentioned, we have amenities, fair number of family sized units. We're also looking to conduct outreach to senior citizens for the smaller units so that those units can be put to, to better use. Um, this is the unit distribution and uh, another just general description since the specific affordability is still uh, under discussion. Yeah, of course. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Um, so, uh, You'll see that this slide presents very broad bands because of the ongoing discussions. So um, you, the, the, the specifics will be um, fairly equal representation, we think, again, pending the conclusion of the discussions uh, of serving those different bands. Um, is it okay to proceed or did you want to? Yeah, okay. Um, that's just another shot of what the building looks like and I'd be happy to answer any questions or uh, proceed in any way if you'd like to. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you for your testimony. Uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, uh, Chair Salamanca. Thank you um, for your, your, your presentation. Um, it's a good total number of units. I, your presentation, though, with the, the unit sizes, um, the one, two, and three bedrooms, okay, 55 units, percentage of units. All right. It's good to see a good size of three and two bedroom units. I mean, th that's an ask that we've had in, in, in the community. So I, I, I thank you for that. Um, a question for HPD. Have you released your new term sheets already? Uh, we have not formally released our new term sheets. I think, you know, as you know, we've been considering some changes and starting to work with developers towards changes, but have not formally released them. So what term sheets are they working out of? Their presentation has, um, formerly homeless, 30% to 80% AMI, mm -hmm. but HPD's presentation is up to 90% AMI. 
So, I, I mean, they're working off of the Ella term sheet. I think it's, you know, our folks here can correct me if I'm wrong. I think we've been doing a little bit of a hybrid of both, like, what the current Ella term sheet is, as well as we're looking at some of the changes, I think, to make uh, the program really work. Um, but again, I think as far as the specific AMIs on this, just still working out where we're going to land finally. So to, to FIPS, when you got an approval in February of 2019, the present in, in front of the community board, the yeah. presentation that you made was what AMI levels? So it was the slide that you see here. The slide that I so see here. So fairly can you, can you broad. Up to 80% AMI. But yet you're here in the council asking us to approve 90% AMIs. Do you know when the 90 AMIs are? Yeah, I mean, I guess, I guess that's right. In that the, the time of the community board presentation, 80% of AMI was the highest band under contemplation. So how do you expect the community to trust you when you're presenting to them a plan and you're getting their approval for from 30% AMIs to 80% AMIs? You went to the borough board and got borough president approval with that same, that same plan and you're here in a council presenting a different plan. Sorry to clarify, I think the borough president's recommendation actually does have the, ni the nine units at 90 AMI. Does it? Yeah. Okay. Well, can you explain to me, did you go back to the community board and say, hey, our plan changed? Yeah, we, we haven't yet, but we certainly could. So you originally went to the community board seeking community board approval You've made changes to the plan, and you have not gone back to tell the community board who voted on one particular plan that that plan that they voted on has been changed, and this is the new plan. We haven't done that yet, you're right. There, this is why there's a lack of trust between the community and city agencies and this agency. I'm not going to continue to beat the dead horse, but I think that that is just wrong. Um, this is city-owned land, correct? One of the two parcels is city-owned, yes. Okay. Um, and how did FIPS, how, can you explain how did FIPS get, how did FIPS, was there an RFP uh, or did, did, did HPD just select FIPS because they have the adjacent lot next door? Yeah, it was, okay. The site consists of t two tax lots. One of them is the uh, remainder of the abandoned tr uh, railroad line, which is private and has always been private. And then next to that, sort of in between the trench and the sidewalk is this narrow sliver of, um, looks like a sidewalk, that's the city owned. The reason um, that uh, this was originally uh, done was that it was part of an urban rules site that included the rest of that entire block, site 404 of the old Mount Haven uh, North Urban Rule Plan. Um, the, um, uh, the, the, the city owned land, the, which is narrow and is on the outside, like on the sidewalk side, is of no use to anybody um, for development purpose other than whoever would own the, the private lot. Um, and that's generally been uh, a, a common criteria for what we call sole source, when we don't do a competitive process because it just isn't of any use or value to anybody else. Um, if we were to RFP the city owned lot, there's nothing they could do with it because FIPS owns the larger lot right next to it. Okay, all right, that makes sense. So this, uh, this, this development would be nine stories, 55 units. It's kind correct. of a big building for just 55 units. It's not a big building? Or no, it's kind of pretty. Normally, when you get a, 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 a nine-story building, you get more units. Is it because of the way the, the, yeah, the lot the, is designed? Yeah, the, the parcels are pretty small, okay. first of all. But also, there are some constraints on constructability. Right. Um, what is the developer fee that you'll be getting out of this project? So we the follow, dollar amount. Say it again. The dollar amount as a developer fee. Um, so it's typically 15% of cost. I think in this case, that's about $3 million. What's the total cost of the building, of the, develop, of the project? About $30 million. I'm sorry? About $30 million. $30 million. Okay. I mean, sorry, I can double check a little more specifically. Please do. Um, yeah, it's an approximately a, a $30 million project. The uh, maximum allowed fee is typically 15% of that. We're typically only paid more like 
two to five percent, sometimes a little bit more. So my calculation is 15 percent of 30 million is 4.5 million. Right. The budget doesn't support being paid that amount, but there will be so much of that will be deferred and paid out of cash flow over time. Um, in my conversations with HPD about um, moving around the AMIs and uh, getting a more of an equal distribution in the 30 and 40 and 50 and 60 and having less in, in the 90 percent AMI units, uh, HPD mentions that there is a there's a gap right now. Can you tell me what's the current gap now? Yeah, the last um, version of the numbers we looked at, the gap was about $2 million. Okay. And should they make the changes actually, that I'm recommending? I'm sorry. Sorry, I think we actually, the last version I have seen from our folks was at $3 million. $3 million gap? And should there be changes, the, the changes that I'm recommending, what, how much of a gap would that be? I don't have those numbers. I think it would depend on various scenarios, but I think any, any change would pr pretty considerably add to that gap. All right. Question to HPD, and I've, I've seen this before. We've approved projects here in the council where we've agreed to certain AMI levels. It's gone through subcommittee, it's gone through land use, it's gone through the council, it's, it's been approved. And HPD doesn't close on a project a year from now, a year and a half from now, things happen, I understand. But I've had developers come back and say, Salamanca, you approved this project a year ago, a year and a half ago. These are the AMIs, this is, what was re this is what was agreed upon. Now we have to change the AMI levels. How often does that happen? Uh, I can't speak to how often it happens. I think you know, it happens occasionally. I think the unfortunate reality is, as you know, our tax credits are a finite resource and we end up with projects that I think are hugely expensive or where we can't make the numbers work. So uh, you know, occasionally we will have to go back if things have changed uh, to try and reassess, but I think you know, our goal uh, is for that not to happen, um, but, you know, don't know the exact number of times that it happens. All right. Um, you mentioned affordability of this project. Permanent affordability will be 40 years? Uh, I think that's correct. All right. No way that we can increase that permanent affordability since this city-owned land is attached to this project? You know, I think the issue there is uh, the... F and uh, the 420C tax exemption, which is what pairs with the ELA, is a 40-year tax exemption. I think we end up in uh, rough situations if we extend affordability beyond when the tax exemption expires. I think you end up with uh, buildings that are going to end up having tax flow pro uh, cash, flow, cash flow problems. Okay. Well, I'm going to be very transparent and very honest. Um, at the moment, I'm not supporting this project. If you want support from, from my office or myself, you have to remove option two from MIH. Uh, you have to go back to the community board and see, you, you need to meet with them and see if you can get an updated letter of recommendation because you did change the AMIs and there is no way that I can support a project where 90% AMI units are higher than my 30% AMI units. Yeah, and I do just want to, because of, I have the borough president's recommendation in front of me that I think does reflect the 90 AMI mix, I want to make sure that and we can go back and look at what the community board approved and actually confirm whether or not there is a discrepancy there. I'm That's sorry fine. I don't have that before me today. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. I, I just have uh, one quick question, if, if, if you can clarify something for me. Can you list the minimum square footage uh, for affordable housing units? How much for a studio, how much for one bedroom, two bedroom, three bedroom? I don't have HPD's guidelines in front of me. Um, the, these unit sizes that you saw on the slide are not the very bare minimum sizes, but they're probably in the lower half of the range that HPD provides. As you know, they, the design guidelines were revised a, year, a couple years ago, and they did produce a smaller set of units than previously. So from my understanding, New York City sets a minimum apartment size for affordable housing. Market rate buildings do not have to follow those regulations, correct? Correct, other than zoning requirements. Right. So the apartment square footage for uh, this purpose is to measure the inside face of the walls. It says that a studio apartment minimum is 400 square feet. Is that correct? Uh, 
it's, it, there are different calculations of square footage. Um, in the zoning code, that 400 is, is measured a different way than that 361 you see here. We're fully complying with zoning. So explain that to me. Well, they're, they're different. I mean, the, the zoning code is looking at floor area as zoning defines it. It has- Can you just speak a, in, uh, into the mic a little bit more? Yeah, sorry. And, it's a, and a, way of, a way of calculating that, the type of square footage you see for the purposes of an architect talking about the square foot of the unit isn't calculated exactly the same way. But if we have a minimum size, correct? I'm HPD, I'm, I'm going to you now, right? It's 400 square feet. How is it that we're then allowing a studio to zero bedroom be 361 square feet? I don't have the answer to that in front of me. I can certainly follow up with you guys to make sure we're not getting anything. I, think I mean, I, be, I, I, I I'm sure really there is important. an explanation, but. Uh, just because the requirements that I'm seeing right here, uh, what the breakdown here is much less than what the city has in terms of requirements for a minimum size unit for affordable housing. One bedroom is 575 square feet, two bedrooms is 775 square feet, three bedrooms are 950 square feet. Right. And, and, then, and then looking at also what was given to the borough president and what he had put together, we have 11 studio units at approximately uh, 418 gross square feet for studios. The one bedrooms were at 645, two bedrooms at 813, and the three bedrooms at 1,109 square feet. And three of those units would be specifically designed to uh, mm -hmm. pursue the ADA uh, mandates for the one and two bedrooms. I mean, sounds like we should do our research and get back to you on that. I, I think um, that that is really important given the size of these units and what we're okay. seeing here um, would be uh, extremely important on the process and I think for the chair and his constituents, uh, they certainly would deserve uh, to uh, have the right to not be uh, having less of the square footage made available to them. Very good, we'll follow up. Thank you. Thank you, uh, any other questions, Chair? No, nope. uh, I just wanna take the opportunity to recognize Council Member uh, Reynoso. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank the panel for coming here and testifying here today. Uh, you, thank you. You are dismissed. And uh, I will now uh, reopen the vote uh, for Council Member Reynoso. On a continuing vote of the land use items, Council Member Reynoso. Thank you, Chair. I vote aye on all. I have a vote of eight in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and no abstentions. The land use items are approved and referred to the full land use committee. Are there any other members of the public who wish to testify? Uh, seeing none, I now close the public hearing on this application and it will be laid over. Uh, this concludes today's meeting and I would like to thank the members of the public, my colleagues, uh, council and land use staff uh, for attending. Uh, this meeting is hereby adjourned.